So the first slide that I want to talk about is when we talk about leadership, leadership is not based on position. And everyone is a leader. There's a statement that if you look at many leadership books, it will say that everyone is a leader and everyone is always leading. So yes, you might not have a position or a title, some of you may, but the Prophet said, All of you are shepherds and all of you will be asked about your flock. So there are certain aspects of leadership that we all have. So how do we define leadership? This is in the tutorial. How would you define leadership? Yes, but that's a good Success of okay, someone who wishes and will do things for the success of others. Okay, go ahead, Melissa. Somebody who inspires others to do their best. Okay, inspires others to do their best. What else? And your sisters? Justice. Justice, okay. Lead by example. Lead by example. Okay. So all of these things are the important because influence. Influence, use the power of influence that a person has to guide people to meet objectives and goals that are beneficial for them is done in this dunya and the akhir. Right? There's a whole other presentation we can do on the evil side of leadership. No one can argue that Hitler was not an effective leader. But he mobilized people for bad and evil and purposes, right? And there will always be people. Was Fir'aun influential on his people? Yes. yes. Right? So was he a leader? Yes, but he wasn't a good leader. So the question that we have to understand is that everyone is a leader. The, the point that we have to understand is everyone is a leader and everyone is always leading. You may not understand the impact, but many times, just in the simplest of conversations, interactions, actions, our children, our spouses, our siblings, they pick up on these things. And why do you do that? Sometimes we ask, why do you do that? Right? And a lot of times people will say, yeah, because my dad used to do that. Or my mother used to do that. Or my brother used to do that. So we have the power to influence people in many different ways. So never underestimate that. The second picture is uh, a picture on, the, on your right hand side. It's something that, you know, one of the things you'll see about Umar radiallahu anhu is that he actively sought feedback. And he actively sought feedback and then it wouldn't make him angry or upset. Or even if it did make him angry or upset, it wouldn't make him angry or upset at the person delivering the message. It would cause him to be introspective. So sometimes when we have our children, our families, our, um, you know, our, even our, at our workplace, to have open conversations is very critical for improvement and growth. But on the condition that when someone provides that, we don't go back at them or else we don't close that door to conversation. So I want to talk a little bit about Umar al Allah and a lot of us know, you know, yes, he was one of the uh, antagonists and he was one of the people that fought Islam actively before he became a Muslim. But even during the lifetime of the Prophet وسلم, there are about six incidents, but I'm just going to mention four, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran that had to do directly with Umar al Allah The first one is Maqam Ibrahim. What, why do you think Maqam Ibrahim is there? What, what's the significance of Maqam Ibrahim in terms of our religious rituals? Sorry, go ahead. Alright. Okay, the stone is there and Ibrahim is there. What do we do? Uh, do we, yes. Follow the rituals of Ibrahim a.s. So, Ramadan the Allah one day he was talking to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, it wouldn't it be great if we could take the place of Maqam Ibrahim as a place of a Salah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, وَاتَّخِذُ مِنْ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى So after a person does tawaf, the sunnah is that they go behind Maqam Ibrahim and they pray two rakas to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Umar radiallahu was one of the ones who talked to this about the Prophet وسلم, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down revelation to say that this is what you should do. Another incident is that the one of the Qadr, the Adab Nistidhan. Umar radiallahu anhu went to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, O Messenger of Allah وسلم, you know, there are people that come to your house, all types of people come to your house, and you are very kind with the people. You don't have a uh, doormat, you, 
don't have you know, restrictions. So I'm afraid that people are going to take advantage of your generosity and your kindness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed ayat about adab al istidhan in Surah Al Nur, verse 32. It says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, la tadkhulu buyuta ghayra buyutikum hatta tastahnisu wa tusallimu ala ahliha. Thalim khayru lakum la'allakum tadakkarun. That all you who believe, do not enter a house which is not yours until you seek permission and when you come and say salam to the people. And sometimes people will come and knock at the door of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he would ask, who is it? And they would say, it's me. And the Prophet says, who are you? Right, so from the etiquette, it's, you have to say something by which you can identify yourself. So again, this is revelation sent down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, approving the suggestion of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu. Before Islam, Umar radiallahu anhu was known to be one of the people who used to drink a lot. To the extent that you know, he would have certain times where he would uh, black out and he would not know what was going on and things of that sort. So he understood the harms of alcohol. So he went to the Prophet in the early stages and he said that alcohol is very destructive. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he revealed the process of uh, the prohibition of alcohol in stages. But every time he revealed it, Umar asked a little bit more, a little bit more, until the last time it was revealed, Umar was satisfied and, and content. So you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala approved his decision. Does anybody know what the last picture is? Yes. No, it's not a Muslim Medina. It, yes. It's Hudaybiyah. It's a little relic that they made where Hudaybiyah was. So, part of leadership, especially of the Sahaba of the Allah the Sahaba of the Allah were not ma'asum. They were not protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes when we talk about the leadership of the Prophet, some people can be like, but they received revelation. We don't receive revelation. If they were doing something wrong, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reveal things, guide them, and things like that. The reason I put this up here is that Umar of the Allah Later on in his life, he said, I still make tawbah, I still fall, and give sadaqah for the way that I acted on the day of Hudaybiyah. So this was something that he acknowledged, that he made a mistake, because he was upset, and he went to the Prophet ﷺ, he went to Abu Bakr anhu, and he said, aren't we on the truth? Aren't you the messenger of Allah ﷺ? And they said, yes. So he said, why did we agree to this treaty? So the Prophet said, because I am the Messenger of Allah. And Abu Bakr said, because he is the Messenger of Allah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Fatah and Umar and the Muslims they gained comfort and confidence. But this is something that we learned is that even the greatest of companions of the Prophet, they made in their own words the mistakes and things that they could learn from and use these opportunities to learn from them and move forward. So what was his philosophy in, of leadership? And this is something that we have to continuously ask ourselves with our children, with our spouses, with our families, is what, what are we trying to achieve and how are we going to achieve that? The first thing was accountability and responsibility. And this is something that Umar al I put a bunch of pictures up there because of the time and stuff, you might not be able to see it. He had this mentality that I have responsibilities that I need to fulfill. So if you see the bottom left picture, it's a mule, right? And he said, if there's a mule in Iraq that breaks its leg because the roads are not paved, I fear that Allah is going to ask me about it. So he made sure to make sure the roads were paved. Because that accountability, not the people of Iraq are going to complain, not the people of Medina are going to say anything. How am I going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So one of the, another thing that you see at times is, you know, sometimes you read things in books or you watch something on TV and you're just like, like when you read a uh, story uh, from the life of Umar al-Khattab it's like a scene out of a movie that Ali al-Khattab walks into a place and he sees a camel running past and he says, remember Umar al running behind the camel? And Ali al-Khattab is like, what are you doing? What are you doing? So he ran running after and they caught it. He said, it's a camel of sadaqah. And I don't want anything given for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be wasted. So he went after the camel and brought it back. Ali radiallahu anhu, like literally, it says that he, he he's pleaded with him. He said, you're making it so difficult for the one that's going to come after you. 
You're setting such a high standard. But why did Ahmad Ali learn to set that standard? Because of that concept of accountability. That when I stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how, how am I going to answer for those things that I am responsible for? And that's something we have to ask ourselves is, look, there are certain responsibilities that no one can fulfill except for you. When it comes to the rights of the husband, rights of the wife, rights of the children. Right? You can find other people to do other things, but when it comes to these things, that you are the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks about, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to ask you about, right? The fadrain that we talked about. And he had an open door policy. And the open door policy was that people could come and Umar al we'll talk about this a little bit uh, later when we talk about uh, oversight. But people can come to him and talk to him and, you know, sometimes if you look at some leadership books, they talk about getting feedback. Feedback from people who are directly impacted by the decisions that you make. So he would go out and he would disguise himself and he would go out and ask the people, what do you think about the Khalifa? What do you think about the governor? Right? Because he understood that he's the one who appointed the governor. So that's going to come back on him. You see how he used to look at that as well. Another concept. So first one was accountability. The second is shul. Umar had this, uh, you know, mashallah, he had a lot of insight, a lot of vision, a lot of, you know, you know intuition, but he relied on shul. There was, uh, he wouldn't let the senior sahaba of Iran, especially the people who participated in the battle of Badr, he wouldn't let them go outside of Medina because he said, I need you here to advise me. And whether they're male, female, young, old, he, he thought that everybody had value. So one of the rulings that he made, he asked uh, some of the sisters in the community at that time, how long approximately can you be safe, comfortable, and you know, your needs taken care of without your husband being present? So the sisters at that time in that community said, approximately four months. So he made a decree. Any person who goes out to jihad cannot be gone for longer than four months. Umar uh, al he was talking to the people about, you know, there are certain situations that he thought it was a good decision to make. But after talking to people, he realized that they, their suggestion was better, so he reversed course. Uh, I'll give you two examples, I'll give you the khutbah as well, is that when the Muslims were going to go to uh, Persia, Qadisiyya, Umar al wanted to go himself because it was very difficult and he wanted to be there to encourage the troops and if they saw him, they would see the importance of this. So he actually left Medina. When he got close to Iraq, he sat with the companions of the Allah and before he left Medina, he did shura with them and they said, go, go to Medina. Uh, let's go to Iraq. So when he got close, again, they reconvened and this time, Abdurrahman bin Auf was there. And all of them said, go, go to Iraq. Right, you're here, you made it so far, just go complete your mission and go back. Abdurrahman Auf said, no, I don't agree with that. I think you should go back to Medina now. Because we need to have that global vision. Iraq is one part of the Muslim Ummah. But uh, there's also stuff happening on the West in terms of Syria, Sham, Palestine, uh, Egypt, and they have that area too. So if you as the leader are lost in Iraq, then the whole Ummah is going to suffer. So I advise you, appoint one of your best as your general and your leader and your commander in Iraq, but you as the leader go back to Medina. Umar could have taken that position and said, no, look, I am the Khalifa, I'm making this decision. Out of all of the companions, my inner circle, all of them are advising uh, me to go to Iraq. You're the only one telling me to rethink this. But after he listened to him, he asked the inner circle, what do you guys think? It makes sense, but what do you guys think? He said, they said, Abdurrahman is right, go back to Medina. And Umar went back to Medina. And that's something that we have to be willing to do, right? A lot of times we get, uh, we know about Umar and his toughness, but we don't see the humility. He was tough, but he wasn't hard-headed nor hard-hearted. Another uh, situation was Ahadat al Nataiz. After they took over Iraq and uh, most of Iraq, Umar was like, okay, we've destroyed the majority of the Persian Empire now. Let's go back to Medina and let's call everybody back home. So one of the people, he came up, Ahnaf ibn Qais, and he said, it was, I have been told that you want to go back to Medina and stop expanding to the east. 
And he said, yes, this is my opinion, and this is what we're going to do. He said, my suggestion is keep going a little further east, because the leadership of the Persians is still there. And if you leave the leaders in place, they're going to reassemble, and they're going to come and attack you in a few years. So Umar al what did he do? He didn't say, who are you, Ahmed al What military strategy do you have? What background do you have? He listened. And he said, you know what? Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided me through people like Ahmed al Nafais, And they went, Alhamdulillah, they wiped out that threat, and they started, they continued to expand. So you see that humility of Umar al and this is some of the things that, like what we classify as the majority of the Middle East outside the Arabian Peninsula, the Muslims got this during the Khilaf of Umar al Khattab and one of the keys to doing that was Shura. Uh, another thing about Umar is that he was never complacent. Never complacent. There were times where he would have certain leaders and generals uh, replace, and they would go to him and say, did we do something wrong? He said, I swear by Allah, you didn't do anything wrong, but I found someone more suitable for the position than you. And that's how they made it wrong. Is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know the situation, and many of us know the situation about between Khalid and Umar radiallahu anhu. Right? They're both very strong personalities. And, and they're also relatives. So Khalid radiallahu anhu, uh, the Muslims, they started attributing victories to Khalid radiallahu anhu. Even till today, if you read the books of history, they say Khalid radiallahu anhu never lost a battle before he became Muslim and after he became Muslim. So the people, they started to say, that we're going to win this battle. And the Sahaba would ask them, why, why do you say that? Did you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Did you get some kind of revelation or something? They said, no, Khalid did this. So Umar al-Dilwani said, he removed Khalid from his position. Yes, they, they did have strong personnel, they did butt heads a lot, which is fine, which is normal, which happens. Which is also part of leadership as well, to be able to deal with that in a mature way. But he told Khalid, and he told Abu Rabayn, that I'm not replacing Khalid because of anything personal. I just don't want people's hearts to be attached to Khalid. So, look at the leadership. So, he had Abu Ubaidah, and Abu Ubaidah was someone that the Prophet said, he's Aminu Hadi Ummah. He's the most trustworthy person in this Ummah. So, when he told Khalid, imagine, you're going to Khalid and Walid and say that, look, I'm the new commander now. Khalid told him something that these words should be written in gold. He said, that it's not whether I lift the flag or you lift the flag, it's that the flag of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets lifted. I'm at your service, I'm a soldier in your army. Tell me what to do. So how did that happen? That leadership that Umar had, that open communication, that quality improvement, that wanting to be, uh, you're always trying to improve. We have see complacency, I don't know if you can see that picture. All right, it's JK. But it's just so complacent, it doesn't see the threat right next to it. Similarly, Umar radiallahu anhu, he had vision, and this is the next picture, vision, because what happened is that Umar radiallahu anhu, well, during the early part of his khilafah, there wasn't a drop. But as the Muslim ummah started to expand, he said there can, drop can come any time. So he started to build canals and roads so that goods could be brought from Egypt and different places into Mecca, Medina, and other places so that the impact of the drought could be minimized. So just a few years after that, there was a massive drought. And there was a massive famine. But because of his forward thinking and that vision that he had, alhamdulillah, the losses were minimized and the casualties were minimized. So you see that vision that he had. Also, quality improvement in terms of oversight. He wanted anything that he did, he wanted it to be done well and excellent. So what he would do is, he would um, you know, guide, if you look at, you know, sometimes in leadership there's a lot of coaching involved. If you read the letters of Ramadan al-Dilar anhu to his governors, there's a lot of, you know, coaching and a lot of uh, guidance given, but it's not micromanagement. One thing that he would tell all of his governors is that the most important thing to me for you to do is to, is to take care of the religious affairs of the people. Right? Establish a salah. If you establish the salah, then everything after that will be taken care of. But if you're negligent of the rights of Allah, you're going to be negligent of the rights of people as well. So he had that. And there were times, there were times that, look, sometimes we think that the governors and the leadership in the early parts of Islam were perfect. No, that's not true. There were times that the governor, for example, of Iraq, of one of the cities of Iraq, he was accused of drinking. He was accused of drinking after this investigation they found that he really was drinking. 
So what did Umar radiallahu do? He is the one who appointed him. Did he say, this is my appointee and I'm going to support him? We'll make something up or we'll have something else going? No. He had commanded that he be lashed as according to the law of Islam and then he had the person replaced. And they replaced him with Abu Hurairah Okay. Imagine if that happened in our community, in our society. That person would be ostracized and no one would talk to him and be like, you know what, this person is an outcast. Later, that person, years later, he was still part of the community, he was appointed to another high-ranking position in another city. Right? Because Umar radiallahu anhu had this concept of rehabilitation, bringing people back in. There were times that Umar radiallahu anhu, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, would see people after the Prophet sallallahu passed away, they left Islam. They had killed companions. Then they came back to Islam. And they would see each other face to face. And they'd be like, what can I do? I can't really do anything. But they welcome people back in. So you see the quality improvement, always trying to look at how to make things better. Right? You see the lack of complacency. Now, I'm glad things are going well. But he always started to say, we all have weaknesses, we all have room for improvement. How can we make things better? And that vision that he had. So during his khilafah, there's many things that happened. But one of the things was Bayt al-Mal was established. Bayt al-Mal was established, the Islamic calendar, they made canals, rubbed, the prisons were developed, post office was developed, the well-being records were developed. And that is, if, you, if anybody's familiar with uh, leadership change and things like that, John Cotter, he's like the father of modern uh, leadership change. One of the things that he says, the eighth stage for true leadership change is to make change institutional. Not dependent on individuals, but institutional. When he established these foundations, that's what he did. Right? And if anybody's interested, it'd be a great study to do a lot of the things you learn about from modern leadership uh, strategies, whether you have John Maxwell, you have uh, Marshall Goldsmith, or you have John Cotter, and all of these people who write and lead the leadership field. Many of the things when you think about real life concrete examples, you can find them in the Sunnah of uh, Prophet said that and through Amal Dilaran. Life. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said, that had there been a prophet after me, he would have been wrong. Right? So this is something that, you know, there's another there's a beautiful story that one time, there was a person who, uh, a non-Muslim, non-Muslim, who during his days when he was younger, he used to give jizya, right? And jizya guarantees the protection of the Muslim and the rights and benefits. So when he got older, he was unable to work. And Umar found him in a difficult situation. So he said that, what's going on? He said that, look, I can't work, you know, and I can't give jizya and some of my rights aren't there and all these things. Or is it, where's your family? The family didn't really take care of me there. So he said, your money will come from Baitul You We can't take money from you when you're old, young and not help you when you're old. So the whole concept of like, security for the elderly, Umar made this a point in his uh, government, and this is something, the concept of empathy is something that Umar Allah emphasized, and yes, there were times that he was a little bit uh, harsh on certain things, and that's why the companions were a little bit scared. I think it was Abdul Rahman Na'uf Abu Bakr before he passed away, he asked and did shoot out some of the companions, and they asked him, what about Umar? And Abdul Rahman Na'uf said, he's great, but he's a little tough. So Abu Bakr said, he's, the reason he's like that because he sees softness in me, but he's going to be okay. So Umar when he first became Khalifa, he was getting on top of the member, and he said, Oh Allah, I am rough, so make me soft. And when the, the people heard that from him, they're like, he gets it. He understands. That concept of self-awareness. Sometimes we're so unaware, we're aware of everybody else's faults, Except for our own. Our was opposite. He was first looking at his own weaknesses and how to improve them. Or surround himself with people that would strengthen and complement and supplement his weaknesses and give him that strength, and then that would filter out. So these are just some of the lessons. This could be a lot longer of a presentation, but these are some of the lessons about the importance of, and if you want to take home a couple of things, you should take these home uh, responsibility. Masculine. That's the most important thing. It's not about, even if you're at work, it's not about clocking in your pace and a good doctor or anything like that. It's not about, you know, I'm going to get it from my wife if I don't spend time with the children. No, I don't have that mentality. The mentality needs to be when I stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he asks me about those things that I'm responsible for. How am I going to answer those questions? Second thing is shura. Right? Shura is critical. 
where all people, we all need help, and sometimes we find that help in the most unexpected of places. So always be willing and have connection with people that you love and that you trust, and always be there for others to share and give them the guidance and advice, and sometimes just to listen to what's going on. Third is always work towards improvement. Whether it's in your vision or quality or things that you're doing, don't be complacent and always try to improve. And inshallah ta'ala, when you put in that effort, when you make that intention to be more responsible, to do shura, be a bigger asset to the people that are around you, and to work towards improvement, inshallah, you'll find the khayr and barakah come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He blesses all the companions of the Allah and the Prophet. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that even though our actions might not reach other actions, he allows us to be with them in Jannah and Firdos because of our love for them. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us all better leaders. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you know, guide us and guide others through us and make us means of guiding others. Any questions? Comes. We have a few minutes and we can go to Shahab.